Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. It is the deadliest one-man massacre in American history, yet already among the most forgotten. It's been just a month since Stephen Paddock killed 58 people in Las Vegas. For weeks, we've been asking basic questions about what happened, most of which remain unanswered tonight. What was Paddock's motive for the shooting? How did authorities possibly allow his house to be burgled? Why was Paddock's computer hard drive missing? And why did it take so long for us to learn it was missing? Why did security guard Jesus Campos travel to Mexico just days after the shooting, despite being a key witness? And why did authorities refuse to talk about that? Why have Campos' subsequent appearances been so closely managed by his employer, MGM? And more than anything, what's the actual timeline of this shooting? What happened and when did it happen? And why in the world is it still so hard to get a straight answer about that? Well, to these long-standing questions, we can add a few more tonight. Why did we only learn today from the Clark County Sheriff that Paddock's girlfriend could be withholding important information in this case? If, in fact, she knows more than she's saying, why isn't she being interviewed right now? We also discovered today that a police officer accidentally fired his gun in Paddock's hotel suite on the night of the shooting. How did that happen? Guns don't often accidentally discharge, they're accidentally fired. What exactly were the circumstances of this firing? Now, we're not trying to push a wild conspiracy theory here. It's possible the Trilateral Commission was involved, but the more likely and, in fact, far more terrifying explanation is incompetence. The people running this case don't really know what they're doing. You hate to conclude something like that, but it's becoming hard not to, especially when you consider the Las Vegas case in its larger context. This is not the only federal investigation that has shaken public confidence recently. Consider some of the others. The FBI had Omar Mateen under surveillance for 10 months, and yet somehow didn't hinder his planning or execution of the Pulse nightclub massacre. The FBI was also apparently aware of New York City killer Seifulo Saipov, Fort Hood shooter Nadal Hassan, Boston bomber Tamerlan Zarnaev, and a list of other killers, but failed to stop any of their attacks. How come? The FBI famously investigated Hillary Clinton's email server for more than a year, during which time, for some reason, the Bureau gave immunity to several top aides for no obvious reason and failed to tape record key interviews. Why is that? Speaking of emails, the FBI never examined the DNC's email server after it was supposedly hacked. Instead, they just accepted the claim of a private contractor employed by the Democratic Party that the hacking was the work of the Russian government. Why didn't one of the Bureau's many tech teams conduct its own investigation of a matter this important and politically sensitive? Meanwhile, in case after case, the FBI's supposedly incorruptible white-collar division has leaked sensitive details of current investigations to the press. How does behavior like that restore public confidence in federal law enforcement? It doesn't, of course, and it shouldn't. We have a right to be worried about the FBI. There is no more powerful federal agency in this country. They can read your email, they can root through your bank records, they can break down the front door of your house and arrest you in front of your children. Lying to them is a federal crime. We need to be absolutely certain the FBI is worthy of the power we give them. What is happening in Las Vegas right now is one of many reasons to wonder if they are. Craig Island is a lawyer representing several of the victims of the Vegas attack, and he joins us tonight. Craig, thanks for coming on. You're, I think, one of the few people who's been to the scene of the crime. Um, yes, sir. And did anything useful come out of that? Did you learn anything? We learned several things. Number one, we do know that the FBI has taken all of the bullet marks and all of the bullet holes and assume all the bullets. The other thing that was interesting is that all of our clients were telling us that on the night of the shooting that there was nowhere to go. Now, come on. We can see that there's exits um, in the plans and the maps. And then when you're actually there, you can see that most of the exits were blocked. Many of the exits were behind fences. And there was only really two places in which to escape. And that's very concerning, especially when people got hit and, and killed 10 minutes after the shooting started. Is there any indication or have you received any, seen any evidence that the FBI had knowledge of Stephen Paddock, anything about Stephen Paddock before this happened? Well, not yet, because we don't have anything released from the FBI or other law enforcement agencies about him, really. Why is that? <laughs> I don't know. I do think that after 30 days, we ought to be having more information than we have right now. For example, we know bits and pieces. 
we know that he arrived with 10 um, bags. We know that two bellmen helped him carry those bags up. Then we find out that those 10 bags had guns in them, 5,000 rounds of ammunition. We know that MGM claims to have a, if you see something, say something policy. And you're telling us that nobody saw those guns over a five-day period? No maid, no um, housekeeping, no food service ever saw any of the guns? There, Nobody there saw were, him using power drills in the hallway. Nobody saw him setting up security cameras. These are all things that need to be answered. I know you've asked the same questions, and so are we. Uh, some of them, I hadn't even asked some of those questions. How did he get access to the service elevator if, in fact, he used it? Do you know? We don't know. We know we've heard two separate things. One, that he asked to use it, so they let him. And two, that since he was a VIP and part of the M Life program, um, that he was allowed to have access to the service elevator. Either one or either way, it's concerning. But more concerning is how do you, how does a bellman haul up 10 bags with heavy long rifles in them, 5,000 rounds of ammunition? They have this corporate watch um, center where they allegedly teach their people if you see something, say something, and nobody says anything. And if they did, what happened to that information? I think that 27 high powered rifles ought to pique somebody's interest, and that's the questions that we want answered. Have you been able to speak to Ace, Jesus Campos? No. Um, and, is neither it, have, and neither have you. No. Um, and it's our impression just from watching that MGM has kept pretty tight management of the things that he says in public. Why would you think that would be the case? Maybe they're concerned of what he's going to say. Maybe they're, they're concerned he's not going to stick with the NGM story. Um, but eventually, he will be examined um, under oath by attorneys in these cases. And so it's going to be important to, to know the timeline from what he says and from what the other two. Now we know that there was two other police officers on the floor with him prior to the shooting. Um, those are all questions that have to be answered, and they eventually will. Unfortunately, we ex except. I'm sorry. What is it police officers or, or MGM security guards? Um, as of yesterday, it was that two. Um, we knew about Campos, but that there was two other um, police officers from the MGM that were on the floor um, prior to the shooting, um, and that's. But that's part of the ever-changing timeline. So, but just to be clear, not Las Vegas Police Department, but MGM employees acting as security. No, the, the, there was a report yesterday that there were two um, off-duty officers oh, off -duty. on the okay. floor that responded to Campos prior to the shooting um, beginning. Huh. This is getting more confusing by the day. Craig, thank you for this. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Dan Bongino was a former NYPD officer and a Secret Service agent. Kelly McCann, a former Marine Special Missions officer and CEO of Combatives Brand Security Consultants and Training, both join us. Kelly, first to you, you've seen a lot of shootings in your long and varied life. What jumps out at you as you look at the facts around this one? How many years has it been since Oswald supposedly shot Kennedy? We got that figured out? Good point. Okay, so I mean, anytime bullets start flying, anytime the fog of war and all that stuff figures in, it's going to be confusing. But there are some things that, that jump out, and the conspiracy theorists are already doing their work, you know, and, and wondering why. Uh, one of the first things that jumps out at me is um, Paddock pulled up these, these weapons. So you just heard the attorney say, how did he get them up there? How many times do golf clubs go inside that, that hotel? And those paid employees that are there are at the bottom of the pay scale. Do you really think they're risking their job? to bring suspicion against what was supposedly a whale, a guy yes. that's making a lot of money. So there's, there's a human element here that has to be accounted for also, right? It's just not black and white. I mean, could the guy have made repeated runs upstairs with one of those bell carts with something that looked like a golf bag? Of course. You know, so it, what, what seems should be very obvious sometimes isn't. Another thing is there's been a lot of talk about the security cameras, that the security cameras on his floor weren't present. Were they not present because they were never installed or were they removed? And why were they removed? Did, he couldn't have removed them because if obviously security personnel saw him right. in the face doing it, that would have been an issue, right? So that's an issue, okay? I would think that they probably were never installed or were going to be repaired. 
Dan Bongino, is it since you've worked for both the NYPD and a federal agency, the Secret Service, is it obvious to you watching who's in charge of this investigation? And why isn't there a central narrative coming out? Why isn't one person speaking for the whole investigation? Well, Tucker, based on uh, who, uh, who's co controlling the evidence right now, the FBI, it seems to me to be pretty clear that the Bureau is directing this. But, you know, I, I liked how you opened with this, and I think, I think you made a really salient point that deserves repeating here. We're at a time in American history where confidence in our federal law enforcement, whether it's the collection of metadata, the failure of the Clinton investigation, uh, the politicizing of our FBI, this is not the time to keep a lid on one of the largest mass murders in American history. If you have information, gosh, you've got to get it out there, Tucker. I mean, how is it at this point? Think about it. We had this absolutely horrifying tragedy up in New York. We've already got the motive. We've got the suspect. And we've got a general idea from 30,000 feet about what happened. How is it in this case we still have no idea about what the motive is, or if they do, they at least haven't told the American people to put them at ease. Remember, we were the victims in this, the American people. It's the right thing I, to do. I agree, I agree completely. Kelly, we learned today that a firearm was discharged accidentally somehow in the hotel room. I think the police described it as an accidental discharge. Do firearms accidentally discharge, typically? Uh, I mean, the term for firearms training is always negligent discharge. Now, you got to put it in perspective, right? It takes big stones to go into a room where you know someone's been firing a high-powered rifle. Yeah. Right? It was a very hurried thing. The, the normal active shooter response now is to go immediately to the crisis point. Um, there was an explosive breach when they went in. I don't even know that had to be in place. That figures into the timeline, how much time was in there. But it might have happened on a, on a reholstering. Uh, certainly there wasn't any furtive motion in the room that the officer could have alerted on. Uh, but people make mistakes. You know, uh, it's easy to be critical after one of these things. For sure. And I think this this gets the whole question of, you know, why wouldn't you have conspiracy theories around an investigation where there's no clear source of information? There's no list. Gentlemen, thank you both very much.